So, hi everyone. Okay, let's start. So, welcome to our um, DLS lecture series, which is the uh, most prominent lecture which happening at our institute, Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Just to remind you, this uh, talk is broadcasted via Zoom and also recorded, and later on will be uploaded in YouTube and you can watch it if you would like to go through the lecture uh, once more. And if you are joining us online, then you can uh, put your questions in the chat and then we are gonna address it here after the talk. So our guest today is um, Professor Cornelia Denz. She is the president of the Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt, or PTB, um, which is the German Metrology Institution, an adjunct and an adjunct uh, professor at the Univers University of Munster. Um, she studied physics at the um, Darmstadt University of Technology, and she could gain her um, PhD in 1992 from DUT, Darmstadt University of Technology, and then later on she had to stay in um, for research in uh, Orsay in France. And then she, uh, she came back to Germany and became a professor uh, at the Faculty of Physics of the Darmstadt University of Technology in 1992. Later on, she moved to the University of Munster in 2001 and um, as a professor of physics. And since um, 2022, she's the president of the PTB and um, adjunct professor at the University of Munster. Page. So there are numerous awards. Um, I just mentioned some of them. Uh, she's the winner of the Lisa Meitner Prize, uh, winner of the Adolf Messer Stiftung, and she's the Professor of the Year, um, which is an award um, of the magazine of Unicom. And her research, I mean, you are going to hear a lot about it, from topological light to light-driven uh, swarming, but what is, what, what is very interesting, also, it was very interesting for me, is that her research also includes um, gender research in physics and um, research about uh, learning and possibility of uh, educating young, promotion of the young um, scientists and uh, girls in particular. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are very much looking forward to the talk. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and then thank you very much all for the nice welcome. And I hope I can give you a little bit back talking now about complexity by light. But before I do so, you already heard that I'm now president of the PDB. So in a way, everything I do is not the work um, that I'm doing, but it's the work that the group is doing. And I just wanted to show you, now I have to check uh, because it's a streaming, maybe I show with my pointer or something or how would it work? So here is, for example, Hai Samanaf, you did a lot of work. I will show now on photonic lattices. Ramon Drob did a lot of knots and topologies. And here's Jan Wiesmann, who also worked in the field of photonic lattices, as does Philip Menz. And these are the people I will show you something about, also about here, Matthias Rüschenbaum, who worked on the swarming. Yeah, this is the group. And um, let me see that the pointer works. Yeah, what we are doing is looking at complexity to make light work in a way to apply it for different applications. And mostly we have structured light landscapes. So for example, we look for example at frequency conversion by modulating the domains in a specific way by structured light. Or we look for example of photonic refractive index changes in order to create photonic lattices, which I will talk today about. Then we also use laser light with femtosecond light machining in order to create, for example, um, polymeric structures that we use for swarming. Or we look at optical trapping of structures and also looking at calibrating viscoelastic materials with optical trapping. And we also look at microfluidic applications, especially, for example, electrophoretic applications. And at the very end, we also look at cells and analyzing cells in these microscopic environments. And all this is connected to looking at structured light. So we're looking at biophotonics, nanophotonics, and nonlinear photonics. And we structure light, for example, by yeah, shaping in the last point here, singular or spatial optics, 
but we're also looking at femtosecond laser lithography to create photonic structures. And that will be the talk about. And then you can ask, what is now complexity of light? Is it completely new? But when you look in the history, many people thought about how to, to tailor, to structure light in order to get information of matter or information of something else. And this is a very old representation of an Arabic um, uh, educated person, Ibn al Haysam. And he, for example, wanted to put images from the outside to the inside. So he looked at the camera obscura and projected this, for example, here onto tissues. And he also was convinced, and this is shown here in the right picture, that, for example, if you want to image something to the eye, there is a certain ray structure. And because the ray structure in a certain way, by having different shapes you are looking at, your eye receives these rays in a certain way. So there was already a lot of information how light is propagating and how you can shape it. Maybe the most striking one stems from China, from the Tang dynasty or Fang dynasty, where they had bronze mirror. And this bronze mirror, even if you look at the variety, look like bronze mirrors. So on the one side, you have this bronze mirror, mirror side, which is shown here, and at the other side, you have nicely decorations. But then, if you look at a certain angle onto it, magically something appears. And this is why this is also called magic mirror. And it's light reflected from a surface, and there is a surface relief, relief pattern. And the backside embossed onto it, which is only a few micrometers or even on the nanoscale, and you see this from a certain angle. So this is also structuring matter to see how light reacts on that. And then you can look at art. And nowadays, a lot of art is to project light onto an object, and by this, getting a sort of light that sculptures the object. Here you see this is in Berlin. This also happens in Munich. And even in Erlangen, you use, for example, in some festives, laser light to sculpt the, the area. And there was, for some time ago, a Belgian artist, Jeanette Eichelmann. And what she did, she sort of put large tissues into the air, and these tissues react, uh, are fluorescent um, marked, and then they react on the light. And what you see is something like a spatial dynamic um, light structure, because the matter and the light interact, and then you have movements on it. And by changing the illumination, you change also the color. So it's a sort of spatial temporal light complexity. And you see, if you want to interpret it, so, so you also have a topology there, you have dynamics, and maybe you have also some sort of singularities or changes, or even knots, if you would like to see that in it. So why do we want to do that today? I think one of most the aims is to adapt light in order to get better in some of the light matter interaction. For example, for material machining, or for fiber propagation, or even for microscopy. And I've seen already some of the uh, activities in this direction in the lab. So it's about taking light to a next level by shaping it, getting complex light in order to improve that. And so it's about having advanced technologies implementing customized light in order to get better light matter interaction. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about it. So how do we structure light? There are different techniques. So typically what we do, we shape light in amplitude, phase, and polarization. So of course, shaping amplitude means just to reduce the intensity in some parts. For example, for the donut beam, you can change the shape, for example, in a circular way, or you can change polarization. And these three picture shows for us already, this is then also some objects of light where you have a certain point where this feature is not defined. And so it's also singularities that you see here. And how we typically do that, we are using spatial light modulators where we can modulate amplitude and phase, and with certain tricks, also the polarization. I can talk about later of that. So overall, what we can do, having amplitude patterns, which is quite easy, having for instance, these structures, we have phase patterns, we have polarization patterns, and all together, you then get structures where, for example, each of these lobes has a different polarization, where you have different phase structures and different amplitude structures. So we have a full modulation of the light field in all its degrees of freedom. And that's what I will em employ throughout my presentation. And I've selected three sort of episodes where we talk about complexity. The first is complexity in 2D materials. So in this chapter, I want to show you how we can mimic with photonic solid state materials and look at 2D materials, which we call flatland. In this next episode, I will talk about topological photonics, so looking at topological knots and topological insulation. And the last 
we will change a little bit years and we want to look at complexity in control dynamics of small entities like for example colloidal material that has optical functions and then gets intelligent swarming. So let's start with the first part, which is complexity in 2D photonics, and I named this Flatland. So if you think of Flatland, if you look at the history of science, it would be rather stupid to think of anything flat, because over the centuries we have discovered that there's not a disk in our Earth. It's, um, it's a sphere, so this is the f something we have discovered, so everything is more 3D. But especially at a time when there was industrialization coming out at the end of the 19th to the beginning of the 20th century, there was a sort of yeah, vision of utopies and dystopies and most famous known as time machine or country of the blind. This was already a sort of dystopy of a world that was different. By the way, there's always also a, a novel in that way that's called Herland, a sort of utopy where women are reigning. And um, then there's also this book, um, Flatland, a romance of many dimensions by Edwin Abbott. And he was thinking in a way what happens to mathematical features like geometry and physics, like waves in a two-dimensional world. And so he was describing a two-dimensional world and imagine what happens and what changes. And so he was inventing a world where everything is flat. So imagine you have a sphere that is cut it, your arm is cut, everything is cut in two dimensions. And so housing and living is different, and in his novel he explained it, and he explained it here like that, saying, okay, this is a door, and because man has saw this shape of a sort of um, yeah, five um, angles, five edges structure, then there are women, they are looking smaller, and then there's also some yeah, people that are servants or others that are different shapes. So the shapes define how they live and how they move, and they can be distinguished in a flat world. Something else was striking in that book because he explained how would we see physical phenomena, like for example sunset or sunrise. So it would nothing else be than that a sphere changes, and that the sphere cha changes its size when the sun, for example, is rising until it's appearing, disappearing. So in a way, it's not very spectacular in the two-dimensional world. So if we now think this a little bit further, what would be a material that is two-dimensional? What would change? And we know that a two-dimensional material has been invented by this ingenious scotch tape basic from classical graphene, uh, from classical graphite, and then it became graphene. And so what happened? It's an ultra-thin sheet of material, almost only surface, no bulk material. Then there will be other features, I will not dwell on it, but there will be striking mechanical features, it's much stronger than any other material, striking chemical features, because there's a lot of chemical interaction, and the electronic features are different. So the question is, what does it mean for electron transport and electron waves? When they are different, what happens is material? And of course, graphene, as the most important material for many years, is a material that has this potential to make all these things in two dimensional, very attractive for electron transport. This is on the one hand due to the symmetry, it's a hexagonal arrangement, and also it's due to the unusual features of the 2D material. So you can say it's harder than diamond and more tensile than steel, and it has these features that are so striking, especially for example these strong mechanical features. We want to now look at the electronic transport features, and for that, we have to look at the inverse structure or the Brillouin structure, Brillouin zone of such a material. And because it's hexagonal, also the band structure is hexagonal, which is shown here. And you see already some striking features onto it. And these striking features, these are these interactions of the two bands that are touching in points. And these points are called sometimes diabolic points or Dirac points. And what is happening here? We have here linear dispersion because we have here the dispersion relation, this is a omega in this direction, and that's a k vector, and this dispersion relation is linear and has a singular point. So it's a topological structure, and also it's a very striking structure, as we will see in a moment. Why is it so striking? Because if you think now of the electron transport onto it, you see that there are different possibilities. So because this is topological protected energy, Mo uh, electron mobility. This electron mobility has a sort of freedom depending on the spin. So in a way, there is a spin inherent in the material that describes the electron transport, 
or you have the possibility that the electron transport is only at the edges, which then would be a topological insulator. This is a lot of to do with very basic fundamental questions. So there's a pseudo spin, which is an exotic quantum transport effect. It has to do with the half integer quantum Hall effect, with Klein tunneling, or with reality. So these, these topological states are quite important for the electron transport. But then the question is, we are not talking about solid state physics here, but we think of can these 2D material features somehow also be transported into something that has to do with light. So can we emulate light transport into it? And if we do so, the next question is, can we somehow look at these topological structures also in light? So um, how would that be? Here's a sort of sketch from Anal der Physik and in a sort of yeah, um, graphics interpretation. So we would think that we have such a band structure now for light, and that if we structure light also in such a symmetric way, in this case for the transverse field, and then we have here a sort of propagation into it, which would be similar to the electron transport, transport of light, then can we have certain features, and here you would see something that is a topological transport on the edges. So these are the questions I want to address in this chapter. Is photonic graphene possible? Can we have light in order to create optical analogs to the graphene features, like for example, topological features we discussed about? So in a way, we can do that because we can look at nature, and nature already does this. Nature does create color, and sometimes this color is created because you have a change in material that is periodic. And this is very well known here in this institute. So what you know is that the change in the material in a periodic way creates a photonic crystal structure. It's a structure at the wavelengths, and so you have frequencies that are propagating through and frequencies that are blocked, so you get a band gap material. So that is all known, and that's why the color appears. Now the question is, can we realize this also with changing of the refractive index in reality, in, in, in artificial way? And we can do that. And the first thing is that we create a periodic uh, structure where the refractive index changes perpendicular to the propagation of the light. So now imagine we have all frequencies incident, and then we can detect that for a certain frequency there is reflection, and for all other frequencies they are transmitted, there is then a gap in the transmission. And this is what gives then the band gap. You know this here quite well, and you can look at the dispersion relation, where we have here the propagation constant or the frequency over the wave vector, and in some areas there is, for certain frequencies, no propagation possible, and this is a band gap. So no light propagation in this band gap, and of course for edges where the dispersion relation now starts to get curved, you can get for example, the change in the speed of light, and if it's the omega versus decay is zero, you can get slow light. So that's what you all probably know very well here. Now I want to look at a little bit different situation. You could imagine in a simple way that now our refractive index structure is in the direction of propagation. So then what would happen then? Then we not look at the frequencies, but we look at the spatial frequencies that can be incident on this material, and we will have the same. Some of the spatial frequency will be transported, and other ones will be going through and will be changed in their propagation direction. So we have again a band gap. Now we have it for the propagation constant, the change in the direction of propagation, so the change in the k vector in propagation direction versus the transverse wave vector. And we see again that we have in band propagation of so-called block modes, and we have at band gap no propagation of these frequencies, and that means for an optical propagation of a wave that is not able to spread because in the band gap that it propagates without spreading, and this was called also spatial soliton. So it will be about these spatial structures and how we can use them. So how would that be in two dimensions? In two dimensions, we would imagine that we create such a sort of two-dimensional two structure in a way that we superimpose different wave vectors, here for example four, to get such a diamond structure. Or we have six beams to create such a graphene lattice. Now, would that be the same as the graphene or the diamond we had in solid state physics? First of all, for example, for the diamond lattice, we can look at the band structure. And we see exactly the band structure of this diamond lattice looks exactly at the ones we have, for example, in solid state materials. So in fact, Yes, these structures can be used as band structures. And then we have some additional features that 
solid state physics doesn't have at first glance, because we have an interference of different wave factors to create such a structure, we can change the phase relationships between these different beams that interfere in order to get such a structure. So we can, for example, get a honeycomb structure by having here a change of 4 pi. But if you change it in 6 pi, we get such a structure. And this is known as a so-called Kagome lattice. Overall, this is a lattice that has no phase vortices, because it has here a sort of hexagonal structure and here a sort of Hauer glass structure. But locally, there are different phases and phase vortices. So in a way, such a structure is much more than just graphene. And we do it in optics by just having six beams being interfered and changing their phase relation. So it's very easy to change from one to a very similar geometry. So in a way, this is an advantage to get this as a model system. Now let's think at what does mean. Now we have photonic lattices which is refractive index materials that we can create by having light into it. I come to it, we are how we do this experimentally. And we can observe light propagation in such a structure in order to emulate what we know from electron dynamics. Now we have wave dynamics. So in a way, this photonic graphene allows us to study everything from solid state physics by transferring it into light. For example, having Bloch waves in the prion zone and looking at all these features we had. And here you see this again. This is now our um, photonic graphene in that way that we have here our diabolic points. And if you look closer to it, of course, you have again our Dirac point and this um, yeah, dispersion relation. However, what we typically would say in this dispersion relation, which I told you in the frequency, it would be changing of the group velocity, getting, for example, slow light. What does it mean now in the spatial part? In the spatial part, we would have diffraction. This would be a conical diffraction around such a structure. And in this conical diffraction, we would have different conuses. And this conuses also shows us how the propagation of the light is within this structure. So it's the same indication knowing about the curvature of the dispersion relation in space by this conical diffraction. So how do we do that? So on a first glance, we have a material that is sensitive to change the refractive index by light. This is, for example, here a strontium barium niobate, as it is here. And now what we do is we have a spatial light modulator that impings laser light onto it and then modulates in a certain way to create, for example, such a hexagon structure. And we shine this hexagon structure onto the material. If we have these wave vectors being on a, on a circle the same length, then we get a beam that during propagation does not change, and so that's the refractive index that is created. And by a camera, we can monitor that. And then we can create, for example, here, by the inset, by a phase and an amplitude, a hexagonal structure. So then we have here a refractive index that is not changing during propagation for a length of that material, and that looks hexagonal. We can also change this, for example, easily to quasi-periodic structures, and we can change this also to random structures. I will not dwell into it, but for example, in random structures, you can show Anderson localization, a solid state phenomena. In quasi-periodic structures, you can show that you have, for example, local different features of localization. So in a way, this is um, a test bed where you can look at 1D to 3D. We will look at 2D band structures. In mathematics, you describe it by the nonlinear Schrödinger equation, and this is also the mathematical link where you have the comparison of both, both worlds. So we can look at nonlinear physics, but we can also look at these 2D photonic lattices in order to emulate then, on the one hand, nonlinear optical complex solid state or also quantum systems, because you can also show these tunneling effects. So let us have one look in an experiment how that would work just to have the overall picture. So we have a laser beam that goes onto the spatial light modulator, then modulates the structure. And imagine if we want to have such a quasi-periodic structure, then on the spatial light modulator, we realize amplitude in phase. It's a phase-only spatial light modulator, but has in the phase. And the amplitude is realized by blaze gratings. So by this blaze grating in the diffraction order, you would have the amplitude and phase modulation. This goes here its way. And here is the material. Typically, this is material that is simply responding to the refractive index. So what you can do is by having light, for example, from a classical CV laser in the range of a few milliwatts in order to create the refractive index change. In order to see the refractive index change, you can, of course, send a plane wave to it, and then the plane wave was, would sense the refractive index change, which is shown here. But you can also send into 
this structure all different k vectors. And if you do so, all different k vectors and give you a sort of band structure, which is a Brewer zone. And this band structure is then shown in these lines. And these lines reflect the symmetry that is in this pattern, which in this case is a Penrose pattern, and which is seen here. So on the one hand, we can create the structures. We can probe them then by plane wave light. And we can see their um, Brewer zone, so their band gap structure, and visualize it. So, and that's what we did. We did realize graphene in a way that I just described to you. And then you see here that it's a light field creating the refractive index. Then on the refractive index, you have plane wave guiding, and you see that you have the plane wave Fourier space. And you see also that you have, can different, can have different sizes of your two-dimensional graphene. So that is all fine. And we can also think of, can we excite the Dirac points? Here you see such a Brillouin zone spectroscopy. And here you see that this is the first cell of the Brillouin spectroscopy. Now let's excite these six beams. Here the two different colors show that there are two three-fold structures that are phase-related. Then we can excite with these six plane waves. And what we then, then see in the material is that we have a conical diffraction. And this conical diffraction in numerical simulation experiment shows exactly that we have such a band structure and that the band structure allows such a conical diffraction. But all that is um, nice, but maybe it's not what we want because graphene is a star material. But when we want to do more, the question is, can we do other materials? And I want to show you one example here, that is, we can create twisted B-layer graphene. Why is this interesting? If you think of two layers of graphene, then you get a sort of Moiré structure. And this Moiré structure is very sensitive, sensitive to rotation. And because this structure then gives different neighboring interaction for the electrons and also for the photon transport, then you can get striking insulation states, but also for a certain degree, which is called the magic angle, you would, for example, see something like superconductivity, so the light would go through, or the, uh, the, there would be superconductivity in the electronic state. And the question is, can we do that? Some people think that would be a really good idea then to have information processing, twistronics. And as you see here in such a Moré pattern, by just changing the angle or changing the direction, you can have many different patterns of different sizes. So in effect, it would be nice to do so. Now imagine with your graphene, you have realized either with your scotch uh, tape in the solid state um, world, or you have realized it, for example, with chemical vapor deposition, and then switching it and just folding it in order to get a certain angle, that's really a challenge. And it's very difficult and has not yet been realized in order to modulate it. But for optics, if you think of it, this is an easy task. Just now take two of these structures, graphene lattice 1 and graphene lattice 2, and then you just superimpose them. And of course, you get an interference that has a Moray structure. And if you have this Moray structure in this B-layer graphene here, for example, for an angle of 5 degrees, you just can see how then light propagates in such a structure. So what do we do? We superimpose two of these light fields with certain angles, create a refractive index change in the material, and just probe it. So that's how easy a twist angle can be realized in optics. And why is this attractive? Once again, from the point of view of um, Brillouin spectroscopy, if you look at this, for example, this is a Moray pattern, and you see the, the sort of su super lattice that is inside there. And what you see there is, for example, here in a certain small angle, two of these graphene layers being superimposed, or two of these Brillouin zones being superimposed. Because they are superimposed, they give a sort of very um, nice structure that is um, superposition, but where you have almost flat bands. What do flat bands mean? Flat band means that there's no dispersion without having any nonlinearity or something like that. So you just have a flat band, which means propagation without dispersion, or in our case, propagation without diffraction. So that's why this is interesting. And here is first, can we realize different angles? And you see that here, 5, 10 of 30 degrees. You see that we have plane wave guiding. You see that we have our Fourier structures as it should be. And we see in experiment and in simulation that we have exactly the right Brillouin zone. Because this Brillouin zone should be the ones we have superposition of very close by um, hexagonal structures. Here they are a little bit larger for the increasing angle. And this should give this flat bands. And the question is, it's a question, is that so? And here's uh, some numerical simulation. This is first a numerical simulation where we only excite six direct points of one of the structures. And then you see, for example, if you have looked at the video, that here at these 
very small degree, there is a change in the structure and there's a superposition and you have an almost continuous structure, whereas for all the other beams, the structure is different. So there's really such magic angle where something happens and when you have a continuous structure, that means that you have different diffraction features and propagation. So now in the next case, let's look at all direct cones being excited, all the 12 ones from the two very close by structures. And then you see that you also have a complete change from these very early structures to the later structures, where you have a sort of superposition of two structures, and when the angles are large, you have a sort of interference, but for small angles, you get completely different structures, resembling almost the structure from a single sheet but having now the double sheet features at this sort of magic angle. And you can see also that we can realize an experiment. So conical diffraction reveals also B-layer graphene. So we can do much more, and I want to show you something that is very interesting because some of these materials have flat bands that are inherent. So flat again, we are talking about flat bands and flat land. And we want to see what is the difference between flat bands and conical diffraction. And this maybe is seen here in this material. This material is so-called leap lattice. And a leap lattice is a lattice that has three lattice constants. You see it by the colors. It's one lattice constant here B, one lattice constant A, and one lattice constant C. And this is a band structure you have from here. And then you see in the band structure, you have the Dirac cone, but there's a band here in the middle that is completely flat. And so the question is, can we now create such a material and address its feature. And what we need for this is having the eigenstate of this material, and because it is such a super lattice with different characteristics, you can have eigenstates that have topologi to topological charge. And this is just for those of you who are not familiar with topological charge. You know all Gaussian beams, and I've already shown you in the beginning that uh, there are some beams with a singularity in the middle, a donut hollow beam, and this donut hollow beam means also as you see also in the black hole image, where you had seen the very similar structure, that you have then a phase that goes in circles around it, and that causes the intensity singular in the middle. And this is a phase vortex. And if it's a, a two-pi structure, we call this a phase vortex of charge one. And it's, for example, a four-pi structure. We say this is a charge vortex of charge two. So the charge is just the integral over the phase changes and one over two pi. So we now create such a structure, put it as the eigenwave into the material, and what we want to see now is how the material reacts. And what would we expect? When we talked about these direct cones, we saw that in these direct cones, we have here a certain rotation of the transport, which is connected to inner spin, or which is called pseudo spin. And when you address it from the outside, then there must be a conservation of these two features. And this conservation then can be challenged and can be tested. For example, if you look at graphene, we know that a graphene super lattice has a pseudo spin of a half. So what can we do? We can create a graphene lattice, and then we challenge this by having an orbital angular momentum of zero or one in pinging on the material. And so if S then would be a half or minus a half, we would set see certain interactions of it. And so if we do so, then for example, L is, is, oh sorry, L is zero. Let me see that I get some pointer again. L is zero, then S is a half, which gives a graphene um, pseudo spin of a half, or L is one, then you have a minus and half pseudo spin that adds together. And then you see this in the conical diffraction. The conical diffraction for the first case and for the second case show different circles, and they just reflect the inner pseudo spin of the material, because you go in with a certain eigenstate, and the answer of the material shows you how large the pseudo spin is inside. And now we want to do that for other materials, like our leap lattice. And for that, we need to use another technique in order to create such a structure. Up to now, I showed you that we just changed the refractive index by shining light into it. What we can do also is making a permanent structure that is really 2D by using femtosecond laser machining. And this femtosecond laser now creates, in an integrated way, a structure that represents this sort of photonic lattice. And um, this has been employed for many different applications. For example, what we did in our group, you can create by such a femtosecond laser writing an integrated Bragg laser. 
You can also create completely integrated nonlinear optic circuits, which having, for example, here waveguides being written with this femtosecond laser mode and also having nonlinear coupling by having then also a, such a sort of Bragg structure. And you can also have electric fields being integrated as electrodes and having uh, dynamic changes. That can all can be done. And what we want to do here now in this example is creating such a leap lattice. So what do we do now? Then with our femtosecond laser writing, we write structures into the material and the transverse structure reflects, for example, here such a leap lattice or here a, a just a regular diamond lattice. And then you also get this band structure because during this pro propagation in this elongated refractive index waveguides, you could say, in this waveguide structure, you see also the coupling between light in different waveguides, and then you create the same coupling as before and get in propagation our photonic transport. So here is now the deep lattice. Here is how you created it with femtosecond laser light, and here you have your three different periodicities. And now what we do, we first look shining light onto it and look at the regular diffraction on a periodic structure. And this is something that reflects this geometry in a way and also in the substructure, the three lattices. And now, the striking thing is that leap lattice has pseudospin eigenstates that are zero, this is from the flat band, and one and minus one. So what you now see, if you, for example, excite the pseudospin zero, you excite the B lattice. And the B lattice has this pseudospin structure where the outer rings are more emphasized than the inner rings. But then we have this pseudospin from minus one, and they can only be excited by having an orbital angular momentum carrying beam that addresses these two structures. And what you then see is on the one hand, again, such a circular structure. And if you would make a phase analysis by interference, you would say it's an, seen as an optical vortex. But also you see the flat band in the middle because this is a non-diffracting version of that structure from the regular diffraction. So in a way, you have both now. You have a flat band and you have conical diffraction and you can probe that in that material. So to end that chapter, I just want to give you two glimpses what we can also do. There's a lot of rumor now in the solid state community that graphene was a star material. There's a new wonder material. This is borophene. What is borophene? It's on the way, in the way, also a hexagonal structure, as you see here. But there are sort of omit omitted spaces here. And this gives already a super lattice structure. And this makes borophene much harder, much more versatile. And also, it has a pseudo-spin due to its, um, let me see, it's here, due to its band structure, which looks like that. It had, has several striking features. One is that here, for example, you see it's not one diabolic point, but it's a degenerated diabolic point with five conical intersections. And this means that this is an, a pseudo-spin that is involved of S equals 2. Now we had graphene with a half. We had um, leap lattice with one which is classical, then uh, first one half is fermions, first one, second one, one is bosons, but a pseudospin of two is something very striking that is connected to graviton physics, where people think that this is far beyond um, yeah, the um, general relativity, and you can get access to, to areas where you can simulate graviton physics. And on the other hand, we have partly flat bands here. If you look at it, this is not a real flat band, something that is sort of a little bit wobbling. And these partly flat bands would also mean that you have almost non uh, almost diffraction-free patterns. And this material we have also investigated. I will not dwell into it. But what we found is that when you excite these structures here, here at this area of these five intersections, you really get a pseudo-spin of two. And also, you can distribute the different features and see the degeneration of these four cones and can get them, access them with different phase structures. Another one is the material. This is not borophane, but this is a cargo may lattice. I already talked to you about a cargo may lattice. So this is a sort of decorated hexagonal structure where you leave out some structures and then put it a little bit further, and then suddenly you have such a structure. And if you look at it, you see that it has a classical sort of repetition from this triangle to this triangle, that is sort of um, a fractal lattice, a Sapinski lattice. And this fractal structure 
also is connected to a lot of features in the band structure. And one of the features is that you have now here conical intersection again, but you have two different flat bands. And then you see this flat band here down. This is a flat band that is always connected to conical intersection, but this is a completely isolated flat band. It's also called non-singular flat band. And this is one that is so striking that during propagation in that band, no change, no dispersion, no diffraction will happen at all. So this is a very stable structure, and this is in this sort of modification of the Kagome lattice to get this Sierpinski lattice. So what we've, we've learned is that 2D world is not bad in order to investigate with photonic means 2D solid state materials, and we get a photonic equivalent of graphene. But if we go further, we can go more beyond graphene. We can get deep lattices, these are pseudo-spin-1 lattices. We can get borophane as a new stable material, or Sapinski lattices. So photonics can be on the forefront of sort of um, next generation solid state materials and test their dispersion behavior. And if you like, you can look at more detail into this journal. Now let's get at another topic, which is complex topological photonics. And this is called complex topological photonics. I want to give you two examples. And the first one will be a connection to the, what we discussed just now. And the next one will be something different. But first, what is topology? We are all used to look at symmetry. We know very well what symmetry is. We know there's a geometrical concept. And we know that, for example, which operation we need to do in order to reproduce the same system. Turning here the ice crystal by 30 degrees, here having a rotation also of 60 degrees, or here having a mirror um, a translation in order to switch it to the same figure. Now there are certain um, materials that are not as rigid as these ones, and the question is if there is something can when, when they're stretching a material, or material is soft, what will be then the sort of geometrical notion that is the um, reproducing of the same system? And this is the idea of topology. Topology is a mathematical, geometric concept to describe flexible objects. So the essential question is, which measure remains robust if I stretch, squeeze, twist, or change the um, structure? And the answer is the number of holes. And in order to describe the number of holes, this is described by the sort of genus number, and the genus number is just a fixed number. And this fixed number is related to an integral over a certain boundary and looking at the local curvature into it. And if this local curvature or if this number, this um, genus changes, then this is a topological phase transition. And if you look at it in more examples, we could see simple things here. So for example, a sphere or a spoon would be the same, having no holes. Here, a ring or a cup would be the same, having only one hand, and a pretzel, and here a teacup would also be the same. So now you can look at it in such a way that a donut is the same as a pot, because if you smoothly change its shape and bend it and stretch it, you see it has the same structure, it has one hole, even if the cup has sort of, yeah, uh, here, some other geometrical features, like having here this dip, but this is the only sort of yeah, hole that uh, is, appears. Then you could also see that in a general way, a cow and a sphere is also the same, except some very tiny holes, but overall this is the same because it has the same structure. And now that you're very familiar to it, you can go to arts, go for example to this um, sculpture of Henry Moore, it's a working model for the UNESCO reclining model, so it's uh, in front of the UNESCO headquarter, and um, if you look at it, you can count, and maybe you would see here from this position, ah, one, two, three. So is this, for, for example, is this um, uh, uh, number three? But if you look at the other side, you see this one is an open structure, so it has only two holes. So you see it's also um, yeah, a genus number of two. And that, in such a way, now you can define topology. So why do we do that? Because if you now want to characterize band structure materials, you can find out, and this has been done by many investigations before, I don't want to go into details, that there's also a topological invariant of periodic system, which is the Chern number. And just now look at the Chern number, which is, which is again the Berry curvature, which is the curvature in the Brian zone space, and then integrated over the K vectors. And this then gives you so, 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 so a number of the Bloch, Bloch functions and their curvature. 
So then again, what would that mean? A topological phase transition is a change in the number, and this happens if there are the features of our structure, for example, here these band structures, changes. So if our diabolic um, Dirac point changes, for example, and gets an asymmetric twist here, then this would be a photonic phase transition, and something happens in the propagation that changes. And that's what we want to look at, and we want to see if this can also be realized in photonics. And the idea behind this is that you need to look at, for example, here your graphene structure, and you need to do something in order to break the symmetry. And this symmetry breaking then would open the band gap, and if the symmetry breaking is due to some asymmetry in the structure in real space, then this could realize a new topological propagation mode. And this is shown here. This is work that has been done by Moti Zegev and his team. And you see here they have spirals there, photonic um, waveguides, and by spiraling them, when you now look again in the hexagonal structure and shine light onto it, light is no longer propagating in a sort of conical diffraction, but it just propagates around the edges. And this edge propagation means that it's a topological insulation. It's only on the edges that light, compared to the electron transport in solid state materials, is propagating. The question is, is it also possible with other materials? That has not been investigated. And of course, we are familiar with leap lattices. So the first idea is looking at leap lattices. And here we did the leap lattice in a little bit different way because we just superimposed different leap lattices to get this chain. Now, if you look at it, the only thing that happens for that structure is that you get a sort of yeah, um, Brier zone where the Dirac cones are shifted. But still, there are Dirac cones. There is nothing, or tilted, there has nothing happened. So what we need to do is, this lattice doesn't show topological insulation. But if you now change the unit cell in a way that you have different edges, you can have a look at such a structure. And at first glance, here, our light propagates on the edges. But now, we have said that there must be a churn number change. This is a topological phase transition. And this unit cell has this um, band gap structure. Here is again the change in k over k for one direction. And then you see that the churn number in all these different bands is the same. So in fact, it's not topological insulation. It's only that here light propagates on the edges, but a disturbance would put it into a mode that is a full band mode. So what do we need to do? We need to change the churn number in order to have this, this phase transition. And this can be done by modulating this wave guys in a sort of wavy way. This means you break the symmetry, and then this also breaks the symmetry here from this band structures, because you see now here that you have churn number one and minus one, so from one to zero and from zero to minus one you have a change, and this exactly gives this phase transition, and as you see here in the numerical simulation, in fact, in such a structure we would have um, topological insulation. And then we can make a test if this is really true, and this is numerical simulation, and it shows very clearly we have now a propagation on the edge, and if there is a change or a defect, like it is here, then you see that the light is also propagating around the defect and stays in the same situation as topological insulation. So this is quite nice, and it proves that topological insulation, if you choose your edges of the real system wisely, you can always have this in the propagation as a topological insulation, because then your churn number changes. You have a phase transition. The ultimate idea that is for a long time around is that we don't have only a topological insulation, having transport only at the edges, but having it only at the corners. This would be a so-called so higher order topological insulation, and this would be the great idea that, for example, you have here only light in these, or waves in these edges being, sorry, in these edges being superimposed. Can we do that? And in fact, you can do that because we have structures in photonic uh, or in lattices that are in a way aperiodic, and this aperiodicity allows you also to get another symmetry breaking. And this symmetry breaking can be best done if you, for example, realize an aperiodic Fibonacci lattice. We have done this in earlier times and where we practice into it. So now we look at this Fibonacci lattice and how light propagates into it. What we want to see is such a churn number phase transition. And this is shown here, if you look here at the eigenstates, or better, that you see that we have different um, levels, and these different levels re represent different churn numbers, and we, we here have structures within one band. The interesting thing is, if you look at these structures, it seems like not only this yellow 
um, points or these red points can be isolated points of second order um, topology insulation. Let's put it that way. It's not only um, spots that are here. Where is my pointer here? It's uh, only here at the border, but also in between. And this is now the striking thing, that if we write such a structure and we look at light propagation, we see that in the first glance of light propagation in position one at the edge, we see that this dual propagation goes onto the edge. Now, if we are at an area in the middle, we also see that for this area in the middle, we have an inner topological protection. But if you go to other points in the middle, we don't have inner topological protection. And this is due to this sort of structure here because we have different distances between the different coupling within the propagation of these waves in the Briar zone. And so what we see is, on the one hand, we have topological insulation at the center or at the edges, but we have also diffraction in the bulk. And that is a quite striking feature that we have here. Um, I think I have to have a li little bit. Have to look a little bit at a watch. Um, how long was my talk meant? I'm I'm already over time. Or uh, okay, so maybe then I switch um, one topic, which is topological knots, and you may ask me afterwards. We can also create out of topological in periodic 2D structures, we can create 3D structures. By polarization and phase modulation, we can create such sort of knots and knotted structures into it. And so at the very end, I want to talk to you about another topic that has to do with complexity of matter and complexity of light. This is swarming. Swarming is known as something where living artificial agents or robots interact to each other and Typically, their swarming stems to the fact that they are very simple objects. They respond to an external stimulus, look at their local neighbors, and then adopt the average speed of all those, and then they have a common motion. And this is known not only from birds in flockings, but also, for example, from some of these um, yeah, fusarum um, structures that can show it. The question is, can it also be done artificially? And this is a big science. It's called artificial active matter. And this active matter is something that all people are looking for, to have active swimmers, micro robots, active um, functional like um, yeah, agents that can be created from artificial matter. And this is a lot of activities that are there. You can do this, for example, by bubble-driven. If gas is in there, there's diffusophoresis, there's magnetic effects, and there's other effects. What we want to do is using light. And there are two examples what you can do. One is something that's um, from the University of Seeget. And you see here, this is a sort of swimming object. And it's not very difficult to see. There's total internal reflection or total external reflection on it. And this gives them momentum. So this can swim in a certain direction. Another um, structure has been realized by Grover Schwarzlander. This is a structure that has this sort of elongated shape. And when lights come to it, this is a sort of flying structure that is elevated and then gets moving motion into it. This is shape-based structures. And our idea was, why do we need to have shape-based structures when we have a shape that is symmetry broken? There's always light that is incident and can bring a structure in motion. We also want to change the refractive index. And that's what we did. We looked at so all these different shapes and had a look. If you have a symmetry breaking shape and if you have a symmetry breaking in refractive index, how then can we use light to propel such a particle? And now to cut a long story short, let me say it works. You can modulate it theoretically and you can do it experimentally. And experimentally, you're doing it by, again, femtosecond laser machining. But this time, you do additive manufacturing and create a structure into it. And by having different light incidents, you get different refractive indices. And with this material, which is a polymeric material, you can realize this refractive index structure. And so we have realized all these structures, have put, have realized a lot of them, and then have looked at swimming. And here's an example of a small video of such a cap. And a cap, for example, then when light is incident, which is now happening, I hope so, yeah, the, the video is running, then the cap just turns around. And after having turned around, let me see if it had stopped. Yeah, now it moves again. Then it starts moving, and then it moves forward and is driven by light with around a speed of 
four micrometer per second. And if you look at it, it's then such a motion that is expected also. We also have looked at a bullet, and when a bullet moves, it moves for a long way, and if it has this refractive index change and the shape change, it moves much more further than when it is only a refractive index change or only a shape change, and so the combination of it really gives a high speed. And now the questions we are dwelling with is what happens if such a structure is uh, if such a um, species is in a structured light, and you see then it moves in a certain way and reacts to the structured light. And here, this is numerical simulations from our colleagues at the University of Münster. You see here one particle in structured light that moves around it, but then you see that here there is swarming and clustering if many particles are in such a structured light. And that's what we are doing at the moment. We are looking at this in experiment. So in a way, we have structured light and we get such swarming behavior or this collective behavior. But what we also want to do, and this is the next step upcoming, we want to have them having memory effects, which can be done by light from the side, because then we have a sort of waveguide structure. And then we can have feedback. And by feedback in such a structure, then by having a feedback mirror, this gets also memory, and then we have memory and feedback, and this gives then intelligent matter. And that's what we actually are doing. So light activated swarming means having small, a number of small, simple entities, putting them together in complex light structure, and then getting collective action by light into it. And with that, I wanted to end. I want to show you that light especially complex lights, allows you in interaction with matter to create solid state 2D materials, to get, for example, feeds of complex light action, get band structure. I didn't show you that we also can realize knots, we can realize topological insulation, or we can also create swarming behavior, all these structures. And with that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. I'm sure there are questions, so please, Andrea. Hello. Hello. Very nice, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I got confused uh, um, about uh, superimposing two uh, photonic graphenes, say, let's call it like this. That is, if I understood correctly, each uh, layer is created by nonlinear interaction on a material, right? So how in practice uh, you superimpose a linearly two nonlinear structures? So what we typically do is that we want to have the refractive index afterwards from the two graphene structures to have the same, let's say, refractive index depth. So what we do is, because this material has a certain response time, that during the response time we oscillate the two gratings being superimposed. This is known from in former times of data storage, like incremental recording, and during this increment, we adapt them to have at the very end the same depth of refractive index structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Um, so if I understood your two-dimensionality is uh, something like a two-dimension that is extended in the third dimension. <laughs> yeah, in a way that is like that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, because... So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, long time ago, there were photonic crystals that uh, were hard to get two-dimensional. So we had, for example, experiments in uh, silicon that was etched very deep. And then uh, the, in a way, we were thinking we had a two-dimensional thing, but the structure was going in the third dimension, kind of a little bit like what you have here. But there was always a diffraction that is bothering you because light at the end was not two-dimensional. So can you say something about the reality of the fact that your light, it, it wasn't clear to me from which angle you're actually illuminating this. You're not going through the lattice, right? You're going perpendicular. Uh, or in the plane of the lattice. Yeah. Is the yeah, so definition. if you think of a material that is elongated like that, you have your structure like that, your refractive index structure, and it goes all the way through and being the same. And this is due to the fact of our constru construction. It's just k vectors that have the same length. And if you have k vectors that lie on a circle, this means when putting this into an inf interference, interference is elongated in space and is a really non-diffracting light pattern. The simple thing you know is if you have interfering two beams, 
And then if you look at these beams, like having this from an hexagon, then you have a small part where in this hexagon also it's non-diffracting. So the non-diffracting length is of course not infinite. It depends on the preciseness of your k-vectors being on a very small ring. And if you do this with a spatial light modulator, you get quite precise, and then you have a length of around something like 20 millimeters, which is, compared to the size of our transverse structure, is a huge number of diffraction lengths, so around 10 to 15. So we know that this is a non-diffracting structure. And why do we need that to have a two-dimensional structure? Because in the solid state, emulation. Of course, it's electron transport within the structure. But here we need to have photon transport and light, of course, propagates. And during this photon transport, you should always have the same two-dimensional structure. That's why it's this three-dimensional, because you have this transport and you have to be sure that it's a couple of diffraction lengths to then show that there's coupling. And this coupling then gives a certain light transport feature. Uh, can I ask mm -hmm. another question? So in principle, this, this is a wave phenomenon. So are yeah. people doing this in other wavelengths or with other types of waves? You can imagine that maybe you can do this with acoustic waves, but yeah, certainly yeah. with infrared or, I mean, with microwave or radar type of thing. I mean, can you say something about other implications of... Yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware of any. I've heard today something about acoustic waves. Maybe you can do that. But one of my colleagues is doing this in magnetic sheets. And you can have magnons being propagated into it, and you can create also by then structures in these magnons in the same way, and then you get also two-dimensional answers of magnonic waves in these structures. So yes, this is a general feature of all waves. Questions? Thank you very much. Um, you showed that in the material borophene, um, you can simulate uh, spin two particles and general relativity you mentioned. Can you elaborate how far this goes, how far these um, analogies go? Yeah, so these analogies are of course always that you in a way have a optical material that emulates all the band structures of the solid state material. And this borophane as a solid state material is very difficult to produce because it really has this sort of structure where you have a, still a basic hexagonal structure but, but with all these voids. And this photonically is easy to create. And then you can have a look that you now, you always have to calculate your band gap structure, then you have your eigenmodes, and then you look at the eigenmodes that are propagating into it, and then you would see in the conical diffraction that this has a conical diffraction notion of this spin two features. And then of course you can start having addressed not with eigenmodes or with other structures and having a look how the spin feed two features are evolving. First of all, it's pseudo spin two, and there's a, this is a feature of this band structure, of this periodic structure. And it's not a graviton physics, but because spin two is graviton physics, now you can think of emulating this and making experiments and sort of proof that there is graviton physics. And this is then due to the band structure, because in the band structure you have these overlapping bands, and these overlapping bands and this interaction then can give notions that are similar to graviton. Or um, a philosophical question, what, what you can do is you can mimic um, things what, that we know from the atomic scale and the angstrom scale uh, with gratings in the lambda micron, micrometer scale. So uh, we can play around and uh, see what, would, what will happen uh, down there in the atomic uh, um, scale. Um, the effects that we have there can be mimicked by, or by light. Uh, the question is, um, do you think it's possible we do some things just with light and discover effects that should happen in the atomic scale? So the, let's see, uh, way back uh, from, from the micron scale to the uh, uh, atom atomic yeah. scale. Yeah, in a way, that was some examples because uh, there's a lot of theory of two-dimensional materials in atomic scale. And some of the theory, and this already is limited by something simple like B-layer graphene, 
that is it's almost impossible for solid state physicists in experiment to make any angle in B layer graphene. They have different techniques, chemical vapor deposition of two layers, then they have a certain angle, then they're sort of flapping one graphene over it, but this is always fixed angles. And so we can just just reproduce our experiment with many different angles and have this all these features. This is one part. And borophane, for example, has been sort of um, now produced in a way or have been realized, but the band structure is at the moment not very very clear. So making these experiments in order to see, for example, all these questions that we have discussed cannot happen because it's the material is still is not very homogeneous and so this is broadening of the band structure and so on. So in a way we are already there and looking at these features. And when we now look at all this conical diffraction, I didn't show you much about this, also for these fractal-like lattices, this is something that solid state theoreticians are suggesting, but it's really tough in order to create this. It's almost impossible to have it with the Scotch technique. This is much too, it always gives islands of one or two layers of graphene. And if you do it with chemical vapor deposition or with additive manufacturing, then this also imposes challenges. It's always um, stationary. You don't have any dynamic possibility to change some parameters to test out it. So in a way, yeah, we are in a way pioneering it. And so, especially for this B-layer graphene, which we didn't thought was so spectacular from the optical point of view, we have a lot of questions from people saying, how did you make this? And we cannot reach B-layer graphene. And do you see the matching angle in this thing? So in a way, we are already there. Yes, huh? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I can, because I didn't, I, I skipped this part, maybe I can show you something different. We can do something else. Let me see where I have that. Um, oh, I'm not here. Um, um, let me just pick it out. Um, there's also the mathematical theory of knots. And knots is something that is completely mathematical. And you can say in one dimension you have a rope, in two dimensions your rope can make these things, but in three dimensions you can make a knot. We all know how knots work. And there's some ideas that is, if you have a knot in Mathematically, it's a knot in four dimensions that's projected in three dimensions. It says you can say stock donut, or you can say it's key rings being superimposed to each other. There is, there's a lot of mathematics behind saying this is a structure that is mathematically complex, and what we do is just realizing that's a structure by light having superposition of different donut beams with different, with different vortices and then superimposing them like these key rings in a three dimension and then showing that this really exists optically. And these hopfions have a lot to do with looking at singularities and how singularities can propagate in three dimensions. The two dimension cut, by the way, of a hopfion is a skirmion. Skirmions are known from magnetic structure, but you can use polarization as a substitute of it and then also emulate it. And this is a first Hopfion ever in experiment. So in a way, yes, you can pioneer these things, even if they are more connected to solid state physics. Yeah, thank you, very inspiring. I, I have a question towards the last uh, part about mm -hmm. the swarming, and maybe I was missing something. So uh, for, for birds, I mean, because of their mutual interaction, you see these nice time varying patterns uh, uh, from kind of self-organization or so. Now, when you, the experiments that you showed, you had these uh, light patterns. So basically you were imposing the patterns and the particles responded to the light gradient. But this would be different, but maybe I'm missing something. Are they also? So what is happening, maybe you see it here, that this particle changes its speed and its motion as soon as it comes to light, because this is a responsive material, and it changes its speed as soon as it has a different light, and then it's Brownian motion in between when it's in the dark area. And now you have Brownian motion compared with this controlled strength in changing the interaction, and this changing interaction is then that all these particles interact with the nearest neighbor, and suddenly they build a clustering in this pattern because the light speed, so it's a change of speed, and then this change of speed means also interaction that changes and then they cluster like that. And this is the, the classical notion of you have, so the light is functionalization, the motion, you could say, by changing the speed. And this functionalization then leads to an interaction of the particles with different speeds. And if you have a light pattern, you sort of do the functionalization in a spatially distributed way. 
So I, 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 I kind of see that these particles become faster when the intensity gets higher. How do I see that the particles interact? So this is something I, I uh, they interact in a way by, I didn't put that, let me, I switched a lot of things here because it's a theory. What you typically have to um, obey is, of course, light goes into the material, that is Fermat's principle, and there's reflection. But then you also create a force, so you have to look at the force. And then you are in a hydrodynamic environment, and particles that come close to each other interact by the hydrodynamic interaction. So this is the interaction is by the hydrodynamic part, the light is driving and giving the speed, and those together with the hydrodynamic interaction is this sort of swarming that exists then. The last question. Um, so, I mean, we, we are all light lovers, so we <laughs> can do whatever uh, that we can do with them. But coming back to the previous question, um, if you wanted to be a devil's advocate, wouldn't you say that you can do all those experiments in the computer and you don't have to actually go through the trouble of making them? Because um, all these possibilities of different types of lattices and everything that happens, I mean, you have Maxwell's equations, and are there complexities in solving them? Sometimes, you know, in the nanoscopic region, if they're not trivial, although nowadays, you know, you have all kinds of packages and a lot of computer power, so you can just... Yeah, you could, of course, there's, there's theory, theoretical numerical work on band gap structures, and you can see all these features. Maybe it's not, um, it's on the one hand, discovering new physics and experiment that has been predicted in an in a medium that allows you to do it in different ways than in solid state physics. That is one part, looking at fundamental proofs of systems that have been predicted. But on the other hand, thinking in a different way, if you have a material in photonics with such a flat band, this can also be for information processing, something where you have information processing without dispersion, without diffraction. So if you put it the other way around, because photonics that we love is also close to modern types of information processing, then this is very attractive. Addressing it with structured light can give different propagation speeds, different propagation directions. So we have a lot of possibilities to create selective operations for optical information processing. So that would be an extra that no other area could do. Hey, uh, there are probably more questions, but I think at this point we stop the public discussion part and just uh, thank uh, Frau Dens for the excellent talk. Thank you.